Okay, good evening. I'm Pierre Atlas. I, I'm a political mm -hmm. science professor, yes. and I serve as director of the Richard G. Luger Franciscan Center for Global Studies. Thank you all for coming tonight. Um, uh, Greg Ballard uh, served uh, 23 years in the U.S. Marine Corps, retiring as a lieutenant colonel, and then he returned home to Indianapolis in 2001. And in 2007, he ran a successful campaign, um, defeating the incumbent uh, to become the 40th mayor of Indianapolis. And he served two terms as mayor, and then voluntarily decided not to serve anymore. Um, and uh, as, as mayor, he did a, a lot of really good things for the city, um, including uh, doing things to help uh, Indianapolis uh, become more green, including uh, the blue Indy cars that we see out there, uh, bikeways, a lot of things, sort of like putting your money where your mouth is about trying to get us off of oil, to actually do things to help Indianapolis Indianapolis become much more of a green city, which frankly also increased the, the international and national recognition of Indianapolis as a city. He became a trustee for the U.S. Conference of Mayors um, and uh, was known for his boldness and innovation by his fellow mayors. Uh, Greg Ballard is a graduate of Indiana University and holds a master's in military science, and he was awarded an honorary doctorate from Butler University and soon an honorary doctorate from Marion University. Um, he served in, a, in the, uh, the Gulf War in 1990-91, and he continues to be active in veterans' causes and was recently named to Indiana's Veteran Affairs Commission. He is currently a visiting fellow for civic leadership and mayoral archives at the University of Indianapolis. And actually, the last time um, Mayor Ballard was here uh, related to the Global Studies Speaker Series was you were mayor and you were introducing Senator Luger uh, for one of his annual Global Studies addresses, and that was really enjoyable. Um, Greg and his wife, Winnie, have been married for 34 years, and they have two children, Erica and Greg Jr., and it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Mayor Ballard. Thanks. Thank you, Doctor. Appreciate it. Thank you. Well, thank you. Can, I, can everybody hear me okay? Everybody's good? All right, thanks. This is a, um, I, I really very much appreciate being here. Uh, but I'll, I'll just get this out in the open. I could not have given this five years ago, and I could not have done this ten year, definitely ten years ago, and I couldn't have done it five years ago. But we are at a certain point right now where this makes a lot of sense to a lot of people, so I'll preface it with all that. So when we send our troops off to war, primarily the Middle East, you know, we pat them on the back and we, and we thank them for the service. When they come home, we throw parades. We have homecomings for them. We sadly salute the caskets as they go by. And then we go down to the filling station, put gasoline in our car. And no one makes the connection. No one sees the irony of all this. But you have to ask the question, why are we still in the Middle East? When we took over from the British in 1971, in those early 70s, why are we still there? Despite trillions of dollars that have been spent, thousands of lives that have been lost, and tremendous loss of strategic leverage around the world. Why are we still there? Only one reason, that map. That's the oil supply map around the world. We, the United States, defends that. The funny thing is, we don't get much of the oil out of the Middle East anymore. We get a little bit from Saudi Arabia. Most of the oil goes to other places now that comes out of there, but we protect our allies' supply of oil. And estimates are that it's $70 billion a year to protect that oil infrastructure. Now, when you talk about subsidies, when people talk about subsidies for energy, that's the biggest one in the world. That's what we do and have been doing for a long time. I'm in this documentary, The Burden, and I have, I've yet to meet Dennis Lim again. But in there, he says very clearly, if gas was three fifty dollars or 4 at the pump, it's really $7 to $8. You're paying for it. You're just not paying for it at the pump. It's being paid for at another pot of money. But you're paying for it, and you and I just showed you what that what that was. I don't lay everything on the president. So I was an executive in government too. Not everything's at the at the foot of the president on all this. But this is representative of what has been happening in our country for over 40 years. 73. We will be able to meet America's energy needs from its own resources by 1980. Okay. Gerald Ford, we have this plan. It will work. Jimmy Carter, I love this. Beginning this moment, this nation will never use more foreign oil than we did in 1977. Never. <laughs> I 
I see there's a lot of people here who, who remember these statements. Ronald Reagan must take steps to better protect ourselves. Bush 41, in the run-up to the Gulf War, which I was in, has made us more dependent on foreign oil than ever before. It would get a lot worse. Bill Clinton threatens our national security. Bush 43 must become more energy independent. We didn't. I give him a lot of credit for his 2006 State of the Union address when he said America's addicted to oil. He's an oil man. It took a lot of guts to say that. But what happened after all of these presidential statements? What happened? Nothing. Nothing happened. Tinkering around the edges. This little program here, this little program here. It all got worse. We depended more on foreign oil in the mid-2000s than any other time during all the times that I just showed you. It got worse. Now, transportation is now the last discipline where oil is predominant. Heating this, you don't heat this building with oil. Around the world, it's getting less and less. 70% of the world's oil is used for transportation. 70%. 70% of the United States, a few years ago, was 64%, but that is increasing. And so around the world, I think 70% is a good number. And just in moving people and goods, the energy source is oil for over 90% of the time. It's really closer to 95%. We use oil for transportation. This is what's happening around the world. Vehicles per 1,000 people. You can see the United States has been steady state. You can see others have been steady state. But China, India, and Brazil, I have a growing middle class. You can see that China went from 18 to 88 cars per 1,000. That's a big increase. India went up from 10 to 26 in this 10-year period, and it's going to get even more dramatic in India. Brazil, from 114 to 197. Other oh, some other increases. But what this is, this is oil being spent. So you have to combine this with who funds the terrorists, the people who want to kill us. We do that. The world does that through transportation. Because 70% of the world's oil is used for transportation. That's how it happens. And I'll show you this shortly. But Asia has kept the Middle East oil extremely relevant. As we've gotten more off of it, there's still a lot of money going that way. Three examples, Iran has been the state sponsor of terrorism, so designated by our State Department since 1984. Al-Qaeda, really a complex network. I've got it outlined in, in a book that I have coming up. I'll show you the cover later on. But it's a complex network of donations and businessmen but the source of the money is oil. Now think how much money we spent tracking down Al-Qaeda, killing bin Laden. ISIS, at one time, was considered the richest endowed, the most famously endowed terrorist organization in history. Over $2 billion. They started with black market oil. The primary source of the revenue was black market oil. To this day, we still bomb ISIS oil convoys. That should send kind of a signal. Why are we doing that? Iranian oil. Even before the sanctions in 2011, you see the European Union took a lot of Iran's oil. Once the sanctions hit, you can see China, India, Japan, South Korea. That's where Iran is sending their oil. It continues to this day. Saudi Arabia. Over two-thirds of the oil from Saudi Arabia goes into Asia. My estimate is that there is a half a trillion dollar transfer of wealth annually from Asia to the Middle East. Half a trillion dollars. I talk about it a little bit more in depth, but I think the Chinese-Iranian connection is the most dangerous connection that nobody even talks about. This is why Iranian energy independence is irrelevant. I just, 
It's okay, but it doesn't really matter. It just doesn't matter. It's really a campaign talking point. And frankly, I, I don't know how I feel when I hear somebody talk about energy independence on the campaign trail. Because it doesn't really matter. Plus, oil is a global commodity. It's not a national commodity. It's a global commodity. We import oil, and now we export oil, as do other people. It's a global commodity. So, who produces the oil? Everybody thinks we do a lot. We don't. We're creeping up right now. We probably produce about 11 to 12 percent of the oil in the world. You can see that 77 million barrels per day, we're probably at 9 or 10 right now, given what's happened in the last couple of years. We don't produce a lot of it. You can see where OPEC has been over 50 percent, but generally speaking, they're in the 40, 45 percent. That's who produces it. How much do we use? You can see back in the 60s, we used almost half the oil in the world. Now we use about 20% of the oil in the world. This doesn't mean we got more efficient at all. We're actually using more. This is because the rest of the world is now using this oil. As I showed you with the vehicles per 1,000 people. That's why our percentage has gone down because the rest of the world is growing their middle class. That's what's happening. And here's the key chart. Yeah. Right there. Who has the oil? We don't have the oil. Everybody thinks we have the oil. We do not have the oil. Not even close. No matter what we do, this isn't going to change anytime soon. We have about 2% of the oil reserves in the world. 80%, 80% of the known oil reserves in the world are controlled by people, individuals like you and me. Nationalized oil companies that belong to a person or family. That's where all the oil is. I always joke with people, the BP and Exxon and Shell, that's not big oil. This is big oil. This is big oil. And they are not commercial entities. There is no free market for oil. They turn that spigot on or off to their benefit, not to our benefit. And people understand that. People who've lived 30 to 40 years, they know exactly what I'm talking about. That spigot goes on and off. They control the supply of that oil to, to uh, affect that price. So what do they do? What do all the terrorists do with that oil? This is what they do. This is what they do. Embassy in Beirut, barracks in Beirut, hijackings, the Gulf War, World Trade Center bombing, 93, Gobar Towers, Embassy bombings, the coal, 9-11, London, Brussels, Paris. This is what they do with that oil. This is what they do. I know the students weren't even live. But a lot of us in this room remember this perfectly. Our hostages were taken for 444 days. That first picture up there, you see them blindfolded. Including the Marine. This is embarrassing. This is what happened. A lot of people consider this the beginning of what we call political Islam. It was to take over the American Embassy in 79. I was in my fifth year in the Marine Corps when this happened. We never forget this one. 241 Marines and sailors went over to Lebanon for peace and got blown up. Gulf War that I was in. Hobart Towers. Two, two embassy bombings in East Africa. The coal. Five sailors, 19 years of age, died in that, in the USS Cole. Refueling, refueling in Yemen. I think 17 died in total. Five kids, 19 years old, died in that. 9-11, 3,000 people. This is what really happens, though. This is the aftermath. How many families have been affected? This is what really happens in all of this after these bombings, after these these uh, these actions by the terrorists who are funded by oil. I don't think our government doesn't know this. They do. Again, I'm not trying to uh, criticize anybody here, but let's be really clear here. Everybody knew what this was about. Certainly my, my war in 1991. Right? Unfettered access 
and secure access to the energy resources of the Persian Gulf. Senator Luger, who I admire tremendously, and you're going to see a lot of clips from Senator Luger on this, because he gets this completely. He understands this completely. 500,000 American troops, I was one of them, ensure continuing unfettered access to petroleum. We know it's about oil. Right? More comments from Luger. Energy is a weapon. We have been sending hundreds of billions of dollars to some of the least accountable people in the world. And now other people in the world are doing that. Asia is now doing that. Le completely unaccountable regimes. Decline of American leverage. Because energy is the albatross of the United States national security. It absolutely is. Condoleezza Rice, when she was Secretary of State, said this before a Senate committee. Warping diplomacy around the world. Energy. Is there another way of doing this? This is what I call leverage that we could use. Look at how much oil Iran needs to run the government. 60% of their money comes from us. Saudi Arabia, 80%. Iraq, 90%. This looks a little bit like leverage to me. Here's the break-even voice. This is done by a, a group called Rubini Global Economics. Uh, they did it for a group called Securing America's Future Energy. Iran needs oil to be $84 a barrel to be at the break-even point. I don't know what oil is today. It's in the 50 to 60 range, I believe. But for 16 and 17, it was, below, it was below $50 per barrel, which means they're drawing down on their reserves. Saudi Arabia has been drawing down on their reserves tremendously. I give Saudi Arabia a lot of credit because they know this is all coming. You know, they're building solar plants. Uh, they are uh, starting to tax their people, which they never did before, because they know where all this is headed. But this is, again, this is what I call leverage. You can see that Libya and Venezuela are completely basket cases anyway, right? And they're not, I don't know how they're going to get out of their situation. But these people, they cannot run their economies without oil and all that social spending that goes on. They cannot do it. But what if we didn't have to buy the oil? Well, what, ha what happened? So, this is how much we drive every day. But you didn't see this one coming. The average citizen drives less than 30 miles a day. Even rural folks drive less than 40 miles a day. This is how much we're driving. Not, not, not very far. Two-thirds of the trips that we take are less than six miles. Okay. Doesn't seem so daunting to me. But now, as I said before, I couldn't say this five years ago. Electric is here, and it's here now. It's cost competitive. It's not quite even, but it's going to be really even. And most analysts say by 2022, it may even be lower than internal combustion engine cars. Stable fuel pricing. If I see the price of electricity go up and down like this, nope. Oil does. Gasoline does. If you're a business and you're planning your energy needs, how do you, how do you plan your transportation if it goes like this? Very stable. You know what I do with my car? I plug it in the wall. Just like you plug in a lamp or your hair dryer. I plug my car into the wall on 110. That's what I do. Because I have one of these. A plug-in hybrid. I have a Chevy Bolt. And it really works. And it's a nice car. But I get about, uh, on my car, during the winter, I get about 45 miles on electricity before it converts to gas. In the summer, it's about 60 to 65 miles. The uh, official rating is 53, but in the summer, it's more. It's more. This is here right now. This is available right now. And it's not overly expensive. I mean, everybody thinks it is. But if it's all electric, eventually, if we get there, you're going to be filling up at the mall. There are I, I filled up a car at a mall already. Uh, they're here in some of the malls in Indianapolis. You may fill up at a restaurant. Just so you know, going forward, let me tell you three levels of charging. Level one is plug it in the wall, right there. Level two is your dryer line. Your dryer line. 240, right? That's level two charging. Level three is what I call zapping it, the supercharger. Tesla calls it supercharging. Those are the three levels of charging. So, so you know when I go in the future, when I talk about this. 
But at home, if you want to put in something another dryer line equivalent, you could do level two, two and get about 10 to 15 miles an hour. 10 to 15 miles, electric miles in a car in an hour. Mine gets about three to four miles an hour because it just trickles in overnight. But I say stable pricing. If you have a car that gets you 20 miles to the gallon, somewhere in there, probably most of you have something like that, 20, 25. If you go 100 miles, it'll cost you about 15 bucks. I go 100 miles, it costs me about a buck and a half. Sounds pretty good. The capital costs come down, uh, the game's over. But we have to get the infrastructure. There is something out there called fuel cell technology, just so you know if you hear about it. Toyota and Honda really want to go to this. It's the hydrogen. When you hear hydrogen, this is what they're talking about. All that said, there's a few hydrogen gas stations in California and nowhere else. Electricity is kind of ubiquitous, right? It's everywhere. There's not a lot of hydrogen stations in Indianapolis, right? But everywhere I go in a building, there's a, there's a plug. It makes a difference for adoption. Trucks. I'll show you one of these in a second. Natural gas in the short term. Cummins makes a great natural gas engine. Great. And I'd love to have natural gas corridors if we can get the states to do that. But now companies are looking at electric trucks. 500 miles of range. Semis. Semis. Here's some recent headlines from manufacturers. BMW, Mercedes, Audi, Ford, GM, Toyota, Honda, look at Ford. 40 new electric cars and hybrids by 2022. Mercedes, an entire fleet of electric vehicles. This is what's happening. This is what's happening right now. Right now. So why are they doing this? Why are these manufacturing manufacturers building these cars right now? Because of these headlines. China, India, Germany, France, Britain, Norway, they are all considering or have put into place banning the sale of internal combustion engine cars. Banning the sale of internal combustion engine cars. I saw a headline just yesterday that Britain is thinking and they're going to put in level three charging along the highway system so that you can fill up your car, level three charging, in 10 minutes with electricity. People are doing this. This is happening. China and India, I believe, would do it primarily for environmental reasons. I think the other countries would do it both for environmental reasons and for national security reasons. Because Western Europe is probably a little tired of sending all their money to Russia for oil and gas. Feature is right here, right now. Tesla, Model, Model uh, S over there, great car. Anybody driven a Model S? Every year, when I was the mayor, I would get a pace car. Neat little perk. Neat little perk. The first five years, it was Camaro or Corvette, and which is great. And I would take that, and you know, my, I never rat on my security guys too much. But you know, when, when you punch a uh, when you punch a vet, or, or it's always a Camaro with a vet engine anyway, that thing takes off. But you lose the wheels a little bit. You know, it's a lot of fun. You punch it, right? They always would lay back, heading into the highway, and then you know, and it's it's fun. It's a little bit fun. Last three years, they asked me if I wanted a bolt because of what I was doing. So I, I, I drove a, so I like to say, the only plug-in hybrid pace car in the world the mayor of Indianapolis had. And I had that uh, every for uh, three years. But if you punch a Model S, it's a rocket ship. It just absolutely takes off. And what's eerie about it, it is completely stable because of the weight of the battery. It's completely stable and quiet. There's no sound. It's bizarre. It's really bizarre. Very powerful car, an important car in America and around the world. Uh, the, the BMW there is an i8. I'm not so sure that's my style. Uh, the blue one on the on the bottom left is a Volt, only I got a prettier red color than that. Uh, the one in the middle on the bottom is a Chrysler Pacifica Hybrid minivan. That's an important car. Just come out this year. Uh, a lot of people don't are put aside by the plug-in designation, 
that is actually a plug-in that gets 30 to 35 miles on electricity. But Chrysler, who was reluctant to do all of this stuff anyway, one of the, la the last American manufacturer to move in this direction, uh, decided to market this as a minivan hybrid, not as a plug-in hybrid, because they thought it was scaring people off. So now, but you buy this with a plug to it. And you'll get 30, 35 miles. So if you take the kids to soccer or dad goes play golf, uh, goes golf with it, with, with his buddies or whatever, you, you'll be using electric, not gasoline. Now this is, by the way, there's been a racing series, the Formula E, for three years now. Anybody know that? London, Paris, New York, Beijing, all the big cities in the world have a Formula E racing series, and the Andretti has been there from the very beginning. I saw Michael last week in Phoenix on uh, IndyCar testing. It's been going on, and they're dedicated to this. It's interesting. Interesting racing. A little quieter. A little quieter. <laughs> but this truck up here is pretty new, too. Elon Musk just unveiled this. There are other people looking at trucks also. This is not going to be a cross-country truck as it's conceptually designed right now. It goes about 500 miles. So, so short haul trucking, but it's semi, it's a semi. And then you charge it up, level through charging at the warehouse where you go to. Sounds a little much. He's got hundreds of orders for this already, hundreds. Walmart, UPS, big names are want, want that truck, want that truck. Because you'll find out that most of the big companies in the world have sustainability goals and they want to drive these sorts of things. They want this as part of their fleet. This is all happening. Now, this is a gauge on my car. I don't know if you can see it. No, you really can't. On the picture I have, where I took this, you can see my phone on the other side. You can see my phone in the picture because I took it right from my car, in my car, right? So, several things about this. Uh, you see the, the uh, circle in the middle. You see the, the green is electric, the blue is, is gasoline. So you can see that on electric since the last full charge, I drove 100, uh, about 103 miles electric and about five and a half miles. And you see, even on a gasoline, I'm doing pretty good on mileage there, right? About 50 miles a gallon. Pretty good, all right? But the important number is the lifetime number. It says 239. It doesn't say that anymore. But if you drove around the city only, this is kind of a commuter car for you in some way. That would be over 200 consistently, 200 miles. This is what I call moving the strategic needle. I love the fact that everybody loves the Priuses and all that's great, but that doesn't move the strategic needle. If you drive electric 80 to 90% of the time, that moves the needle. That moves the needle. And just with the numbers that I showed you, about 70% and 80% of who owns the oil. I, I'll be frank, my lifetime now is about 120 because my wife and I go to Myrtle Beach occasionally and you have to put, use gasoline on that, right? So we can put the miles on. So it's now about, but still 120 is six times 20 miles per gallon on the life of the car. You know, this is more than 10 times that. That, that moves the needle. What I like to call the pucker factor for people who are selling us oil. <clears throat> Hot day today, that day, 87 degrees. So let's look at what's happening. This is this is 2016. Norway, 29% of their new cars were plug-ins. Either plug-in hybrids or all-electric cars. Notice America's not on there. We are in the top 15. We're in the top 15. If California was here by itself, they would be fourth or fifth. They're in the three, three to 4% region. I don't have the numbers for everybody else, but I know the numbers for Norway in 2017. 52%. 52% of their cars sold in Norway had electricity in them. Pure electricity. Funny thing about all this, Norway's way ahead. Norway's an oil exporter. This is a really strange dynamic. <laughs> Norway is the one country that is considering, I don't know if they're going to do this, but they're considering not allowing you to have an internal combustion engine car in their country. Not just banning the sale of new ones, but not allowing you to have one. That's where a lot of the world is going. And everybody says, well, who's buying these things, really? 
I'm suggesting to you this is a pretty rapid pace of adoption. Everybody says no one's doing it. Yeah, yeah, they kind of are. Worldwide, we're still not there, but the pace of adoption is pretty impressive. And you look at global, from 50,000, 2011, over 700,000. China is the biggest market in the world for production and consumption of cars. Look what they're doing. In 16, 400,000 all electrics, 500 combined. That's a pretty rapid pace of adoption. In America, came from almost nothing in 2010 to over 500,000, over 550,000 in 16. When people say no one's buying these cars, that's not true. And they're just getting more common. And you saw the headlines that I showed you. And people will continue to move in that direction. So, this is the Holy Grail. You get 400 miles in a car, electric miles in a car, and you can recharge in 10 minutes. There would never be any reason to buy an internal combustion engine car again. Am I right? No reason at all. Okay, the level three charging is not there. It's just not not there yet. I I think it's sometimes I think it's eight to ten years away. Other people have told me it's two to three years away. Not sure. They're certainly working on the chemistry of all this. But this would make up a huge difference. But I, what I will tell you is that the four hundred mile car is around the corner. It's around the corner. It absolutely is. There's no reason technologically we can't get to 400 miles pretty easily. And you see what BMW is already planning for 2021. <clears throat> now, things are going to change. Flow of money around the world, probably one of the good changes. All that money that goes from Western Europe to Russia and all that money that goes from Asia to the Middle East, that may not be happening. So we're going to disrupt the flow of oil flow of money around the world. Some national economies may be weakened. Some of those economies we'd like to have weakened. Oil industry is going to change. There's always disruption. There's always things that when new technology comes into play, uh, I always joke that I'm not sure Henry Ford cared so much about horse buggy manufacturers. Right? And there aren't many of those in the world anymore. Right? When new technology comes into play, we have to go in that direction. Certainly here, car manufacturers, but you see that they're adapting right now. Dealerships, a little different story. If almost any dealership that I go in, into in the, here in the city of Indianapolis, I know 10 times more about those cars than they do. Uh, it's a little disconcerting, and I, I'm hoping it changes. Not true in California, because I've gone into dealerships in California testing all this out. They know those cars. Here in Indiana, they do not know these cars, and they don't really want to sell them. They really don't. But the, the maintenance on an electric car is largely keeping the tires pumped up and rotated and putting windshield washer in the car. That's about it. And half the profit, usually, of a dealership is maintenance. And there's usually no maintenance on an electric car. Ooh. But you like that, though. Right? You like that. But there's a reason states will not allow Tesla in. We tried to, this was the third year, last year was the third year in a row, they tried to throw Tesla out of the state. Uh, and they say it's not about this. Yeah, it was. It absolutely was. It's exactly about this. And do you know you can't buy a Tesla in Texas? New Jersey? You can't buy one. The state won't allow it. Campaign contributions. That's what it is. It's exactly what it is. It's what it was here where they tried to do it, but the uproar was so much they couldn't handle it. But what they did, what they did is they grandfathered Tesla in. If another company comes in similar, they're not grandfathered in. That's what the Indiana law is. Gas stations. Unless gas stations figure out pretty quickly that they better put level three charges in there, they're going to fall by the wayside. Because electricity is everywhere. Absolutely everywhere. And like I say, you could... You might do level two charging at a restaurant or at a mall. If the gas stations want to get on board, I mean, certainly not tomorrow, certainly not next year, but they better figure out pretty quickly the level three charging as these cars get here. They better, better, better be in the game. Electric grid. 
Everybody talks about the electric gate. Oh my God, this is going to be horrible. Oh. No, it's not. No, it's not. California's gone through this when neighbor because they buy a lot of these cars out there. When certain neighbors buy it, they already know how to upgrade the electric grid in the area. It's been no problem whatsoever. In fact, I would say with technology, the way it's going right now, the combination of uh, solar and wind, battery storage in the home, and the cars, it actually may help the grid. Because all these, all these cars together would be a big battery. And you may be just filling it up from the solar panels on your home, going into your Tesla power wall, that would then fuel your car up. And by the way, if, if, the, it's being, if the grid needs more power, it'll take it right out of your car and put it back on the grid. That technology is not that wild. It's not that wild. People are already talking about it. A lot of the technology is there. They certainly can take it from your home now. Military, they get to stay home a lot more. I think that's a good change. But you have to you have to think, is all this worth it? Is all this worth it? This is what I think will happen. We're gonna deprive the terrorist organizations money carrying out operations, training, and recruitment. We're gonna reduce, hopefully eliminate the strategic leverage that oil oil rich nations have over everybody else. Stop spending $70 billion a year to protect the oil infrastructure around the world. We do that every year. Above and beyond the wars. A lot less war. We've been in there since 71. It always, how, about, how long has the war on terror been going on? Gulf War. All those bombings. All those hijackings. London, Brussels, Paris. How long has all this been going on? Trillions of dollars. Thousands of lives. And we reduce the flow of caskets coming home from the Middle East. It always upsets me when I see that. I can't tell you how many of those I went to when I was the mayor. Even before I was the mayor, I went to everybody, everybody's funeral. When nobody even knew who I was, I went to those funerals. We'll have a lot less of this. Our sailors being embarrassed by Iran. Casualties in the war. A lot less environmental damage. I should have put the, this other picture up. I lived in this for three days in the Gulf War. Now, it's hard to explain this. Not that. That's nothing. Black all around me. I literally couldn't see where my wife is. Couldn't see my wife. This, this was not in the clouds. This was here. Ground level. Oil droplets. I lived in that for three days. How do you brush your teeth? How do you eat? That's what was happening over there at that time. And it's very difficult, to say the least. But all that, and a lot less of that. A lot less of that. I'm so tired of that, I can't tell you. I'm so tired of it. Because we now have an alternative to what we have been doing. Now we do. And we should be sprinting toward it. We should not be, oh, maybe, maybe. We should be sprinting toward it because we have the alternative. Again, Senator Luger, it's time now to make a different choice for our economic future, for our national security. Now is the time. We can now do this. Look for my book coming out, 2018. It's been down at IU Press since October. Uh, we just decided on the cover, and that's it. This week, I, I, I was, I, if I did this last week, I couldn't have put that up there. <laughs> We literally just got this done this week. Uh, and so that's going to come out by, is by IU Press and Academic Press, which is what I really wanted. So I, I, I thank them for that. So that's how you get a hold of me. For you Facebook folks, Twitter folks, yeah, you can follow those if you want to. All right? And uh, I'm pretty active on them. And, uh, and you can always find Half this audience knows how to find me anyway without all that. <laughs> So that's okay. So, and if you want to, uh, be happy to. So, anyway, that's the pitch. I appreciate you coming out tonight very much. Thank you so much. I know it's a very provocative talk that you gave. And what was interesting is usually when we talk about oil and, and uh, energy, we're thinking more in terms of environmental issues. You made the national security case. Um, to what extent does the national, and a lot of people who are looking at it from a national security perspective, maybe aren't as interested as the environmental 
perspective, or and vice versa. So where do you come together with people who are concerned with climate change and things like that? And a quick technical question that I have for you that I'm interested in, and I talk about this in my classes. So as you as you notice, as you mentioned, the global uh, global transportation network is run by oil. So you've really focused on uh, personal automobiles and maybe trucks. But what about aircraft and ships, which is basically the global economy is fueled by that, and they, they operate in oil too. So how do you work? How, how does your argument mesh with people who are for climate, right, right. want to do climate change and the other thing? Thank okay, you. well, it's kind of funny. When I did this... First of all, you can probably tell this is near and dear to my heart, and I, I, uh, it's meaningful to me. But I didn't have to put in the environmental argument, and I'll, the reason is they're already there. Why do I need to convince them? They're there for another reason, and I'm okay with it uh, because it does. But uh, you may have noticed when I was the mayor. I don't know if you guys. I hate to give out the secret, but. I never used the phrase climate change when I was the mayor. Never did. I don't think I used the word green when talking about this stuff either. I did use the word sustainability. Sustainable. I did use that. In fact, I created the Office of Sustainability. The reason for that is because I know just, you know, each political party has their buzzwords. And if you say them, if you say them, their mind shuts off. And they literally hear nothing else that you say. Am I right? Yeah, they don't hear a word that you say after that. Climate change is one of those on the Republican Party. As soon as you say that, boom. It's starting to change. It's starting to change, finally. But I never I never use the term because if I was going to get support for what I was trying to do, I needed it from both sides, and I used the words that would get there. Now, you may think that's horrible, but the fact is the Democrats do the same thing on certain words, too, on certain things, too. So don't don't uh, don't blame the Republicans. But the environmental people are already there. I don't need to go that, go in that direction. So the other piece about air, it's funny that because China, I think it was China, just developed a ship running on electricity. Uh, so ooh, that's interesting. We do have nuclear ships, right? So I, I think all that is, I think all that is very possible. They are toying with the idea of, of uh, in fact, there has been a, a plane that has flown around the world on electric, on solar power. So I think all that's kind of there. All that said, the trucks and the cars or the vast majority of that. Just cars and light trucks are 40% of it. Just the cars and light trucks. And so you add in the diesel trucks. I mean, you're, you're kind of pushing where all that is, right? So uh, and I would suggest that it's going to, going to go in that direction anyway, eventually. But my point is, it's time to tell all these people who are, have leverage over the rest of us, it's, it's time to stop. We're moving in this direction. Hang on for dear life, frankly. Because, again... It's those young men and women out there are going to pay the price. We've been doing this for 40 plus years. We didn't have any choice. I get it. We didn't have a choice. I didn't. I did not have an aha moment in the Gulf War of 99 and 1. There was no aha moment to be had because the technology that we had was what we had. Now we have different technology, finally. And it's right here. And it's going to be, if it's not cost effective now, it certainly will be in three, four, five years. I think it's cost effective now. So. As the millions of cars come into the charging stations, how is the electricity generated that will recharge the batteries? Yeah, to be honest with you, I'm ambivalent about that at the moment. Uh, all that said, when battery storage gets to a certain point, it will, it's all going to be solar, wind, and hydro. Once battery storage gets to a point where that, that the uh, where the um, utilities have that steady line where they don't have to worry about it, I don't know if you know what I'm talking about or not, there won't be any fossil fuels. There's a lot of capital costs in, invested in that uh, already, and uh, that will have to play out. But if battery storage gets to the point, I, I tell you exactly where I think it is, uh, AES storage people told me this. AES is the parent company of IPL. They told me this two years ago in D.C. or something like that. If you can put 72 hours of storage in a battery, game's over. Game's over. We're not there yet. We're, you know, six, eight hours right now. We get to 72 hours, and with everything that's happening right now, I don't know how soon that's going to be, but if we, if we can get utility scale 
72 hours there, or or we have what we call microgrids and distributed energy, where neighborhoods and houses and everything are one big battery together. It could it could be uh, different then also, but um, it do, it doesn't really matter to me how we fill up these cars. People people come at and say this this and this and oh my God, and you're your your city's powered by coal and you're doing electric cars. What does that matter? Well, first of all, Indianapolis is not powered by coal anymore, as you may know. Uh, and some cities still are. But even if it's powered by coal, it's still a hell of a lot cleaner. But all that said, I'm again, I'm ambivalent about that because I'm just trying to keep these caskets from coming home from the Middle East. That's, that's my point. That's my point. Uh, there's one right here first. Yeah, the uh, issue of the short run I don't think so. You don't think so? I don't think so at all. Not at all. Level three charging is here right now. It's just not. It's not. It's not everywhere. Well, you don't think they'll object to the extra charging time? I'm suggesting that we're almost at the point where there is no extra charging time. For instance, I didn't buy an all electric car because I will drive across the country, right? But still, eighty to ninety percent of my miles are electric. If I buy a a car that has 400 miles on it, I'm going to make sure that it has a level 3 charger in there, and I'm going to make sure there's a, there's a system where I can charge up on the way. That's happening on some levels. Tesla, if you want to drive a Tesla from California to New York, you can, no problem. No problem. It's all there. You build his own network of charging stations. It's not 10 minutes, but people know they're going to be there a half hour, 40 minutes, so he has this nice little coffee shop and all that other stuff around it. But you can do that right now in a Tesla. All electric car, no gasoline whatsoever. That's what needs to be built out. But I don't, I don't, I don't think air traffic will come into play at all. Once, once this gets built out, it shouldn't be an issue. In fact, driving an electric car is so much more enjoyable, frankly, than an internal combustion car. It really is. It really is. We had one back there first. Um, you talked about the money going from like basically to despots in the Middle East and Russia and stuff like that right. for oil. Are you concerned about the money going towards despots who control cobalt mines in Africa and, and like in China? I think you'll see some of the chemistry change. Uh, that's that's I know that's out there, but I think you'll see a lot of the chemistry change. I mean, lithium is what everybody's worried about. I, I looked into that too. I don't think lithium is going to be an issue, but I do think the, the chemistry of the batteries will change over the next few years anyway. In the short term, that's not really an issue. Because, yeah. you know, it's, it's funny thing. Yeah, you can give the... I don't know who owns the cobalt in the world. I looked up who owns the lithium. That's what I was mainly concerned about. I do know where the lithium mines are. Uh, but, you know, those, those nationalized leaders who own this stuff, they need us more than we need them. They're going to want that money anyway. That's just how it works. Thank you for your talk. It was very good. Um, coming from an environmental aspect, these new electric ve vehicles use less energy on the road, but their production is still going to take an input of energy and natural resources. On the other hand, the vehicles we already have, like already manufactured, they may be gas guzzlers, but you know we already have them, and if we get rid of them, they may end up in landfills. So what do you think is the balance between using vehicles we've already produced and upgrading to these new ones? I think you upgrade to the new ones. First of all, the when you build the car, how are the cars being built? They're being built anyway. So what does it matter if you make an internal combustion engine car or electric car? You're going to build them anyway and use the same amount of energy. I suggest to you that people like Elon Musk are building his cars on solar power. So he built the Gigafactory. So that, that's out there. But I, I, to be honest with you, I, I, don't, I don't worry about the environment that much in this regard because those, those folks are there. I'm trying to stop young men and women coming home in caskets. That's what I'm really trying to do. And we can do it now. Mayor, um, I'm sure you've heard the discussion about new localism, how, how yeah. regional economies are going to be more important than ever. Um, what can, as a former mayor, what can mayors do to lead the way on this issue? Uh, well, 
I don't like the term renewable energy. I know I'm not going to be able to change it by myself. I'm not, I like the term local energy. As I, in the summer, because I'm deep into energy anyway, uh, it's just a particular niche that, I, that really is, like I say, near and dear to my heart. But I'll tell people, look outside. God gave us this energy. It's right here. I mean, it's just right here. What are we doing? Why are we not using it? When we can now. All we have to do is capture it and distribute it. That's all we have to do. We don't have to go in the ground and dig for it. We don't have to do all this other stuff, truck it, you know, hundreds of miles away. We don't have to do any of that. It's right there. Once we're able to harness that, capture it, and be able to distribute it in the way that utilities, if, if utilities still exist, uh, the way they do that is great. And that's why I think the local economy is, I think it's going to go more and more that. I wish people would look at energy kind of like they look at the food movement, make it local energy. I think that would be very powerful if we could get that somehow in the dynamic, in the, in the lexicon of America. I think that would go a long way. But, uh, you know, it, <clears throat> there's very few things that really matter all the time. Food, water, air. In an advanced society, energy is one of those things that matters all the time. And we need to be looking to move forward all the time. But you will, you will, you will see vested interests. You're going to see all these legacy uh, systems where they're going to fight tooth and nail. They're going to fight. And I, they told us that. They told me that. They're going to fight those tooth and nail. Because they don't want to go there. Because all the money's invested over here. And if we go there, it's going to be a while. I mean, I, I'm a heretic on a lot of this stuff. I am. We have five investor-owned utilities in the state of Indiana. Right? Cover the majority of the state. When I ask this question, people look at me and say, what are you talking about? Do, do utilities need to produce energy? Why do they have to produce energy? Why is that vertically integrated like that? Can other people produce energy? Can other people build a wind farm or, or a solar farm and they just sell it to the utility? Why can't they do that? But you know what? Senate Bill 309 passed last year. You saw that. You saw that. If you want a manufacturing facility in Hancock County and you want to go get wind, wind or solar from Shelby County, and use that because that's how you're built and you want to do that. And most companies, most Fortune 100 companies are already there. Trust me, they're already there. Walmart, Salesforce, Google, Amazon, they're already there. If you want to do that, you're here in Hancock, you want to get that power from Shelby County, it's illegal. It's illegal. You can't do it in the state of Indiana. That's a little crazy. To me, that's crazy. We got a long way to go here in Indiana on this stuff. Long way to go. Yeah. Yeah. I'd suggest that there's how long is it going to take for Indiana to recognize it? I suggest a lot of them know it, but I was also uh, people who can move the ball know it, but they don't want to know it. But they don't want they want to move the ball. Uh, I don't be overly cynical, but uh, I'll, I'll put this. Um, I'll put this as generically as I possibly can. Mature companies have money. And they can donate to lots of causes, including political causes. Uh, new technology companies don't have a lot of money, and they're not able to. So they ne can't necessarily move the ball at the state house, even though everybody knows where this is going. It's all going one direction. It's just a matter of how fast we get there. What I'm worried about here in Indiana is we are, uh, uh, I, I see this as an economic development issue. You know, we're talking about, talking about Amazon, and I'd love to have Amazon here, that hit second headquarters, great. But one of the things on there is sustainability, energy, da 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 da. And last year we just passed Senate Bill 309, which was completely backwards. Essentially told the renewable energy industry, we don't want you here. This is essentially what it said. They'll say that it didn't just say that, but it did say that. But it did say that. I find it hilarious. I was over there at asking for mass transit for years, and they were never going to do it. Did you know? You probably don't even know this. Did you know that 
Ma mass transit was not allowed to cross county lines until just a few years ago when I was finally, I mean literally just a few years ago with the introduction of the red line and all the years it took us to get to that certain point, we, we couldn't cross county lines legally. So you, <laughs> so you, you think of this stuff and how are we gonna, how are we going to get there? Um, I, I just don't think, uh, I think there are people in the know, this has been said to them, but they're just not going to change their minds because they don't have to change their minds right now. Uh, and there's going to be massive protection of vested interests. I was in that game. I know what I know what that's about. And they're not going to look at it, I hate to say it, they're not going to look at it from your viewpoint. They're going to say, well, we're looking after the consumer, we're keeping it as low as cost. That's one of the myths about Indiana right now. It's a low-cost energy state. No, it isn't. We used to be in the top five. Now we're in the middle of the pack. We're in the mid-20s right now with the cost of energy in the country. Go talk to any of the steel manufacturers up in the Gary area. They'll tell you just that. We're mid-pack now. We're not cheap. We're not really innovative. We don't have a mindset of being innovative on energy. We really have to change this because all these country, all these companies have sustainability goals and energy is a part of them. What I'm afraid of is that we're not going to get jobs in the future. We're not going to get jobs in the future here because they're going to go someplace else they can get, where they can get clean energy. That's what I'm afraid of. And I've told a few people that. So, right, right here first. Yeah. Mayor, since the beginning of Indiana, since the beginning of the internal combustion engine, Indiana has been largely dependent on automobile right. manufacturing and right. internal combustion power. With the advent of this, what is the future for the tens, if not hundreds of thousands yep. of people in Indiana who are now work in that industry? Well, where was the first electric vehicle conceptualized and designed? Now, I mean, where was it? Here. Here. EV1. Not back to 1890. You're right. Back in the day when cars were being developed, a third of the cars being sold were actually EVs. EVs, steam, and gasoline. Uh, gasoline was a byproduct of oil that nobody knew what to do with until Henry Ford came along and they were starting to use this. And Henry Ford is the one who kind of said, I'm using this with this Model T, the, the car for the middle class, and there you go. But the EV, recently, EV1 was designed at Anderson, am I right? Does that sound right? Anderson and Muncie, the area. And I don't know if you know the whole story. There's a documentary out called Who Killed the Electric Car? It's about 80 minutes. It's a great documentary. Uh, but that's what I, again, it goes back to what I said earlier. We either get on this train or it's going to run over us. Because it's going to happen. It's going to happen. I'm afraid that we're behind on it. It's going to happen. Just because not only what I said, but because the environment, environmental people are going to make it happen too. And trust me, these are better cars. These are better cars. Not much question about that. And your maintenance dollars are going to just drop like a rock on these cars. So we have to decide whether we're going to go there or not. I, I, right now, I'd say we're not. But we do have, you know, we are the only state in the union with three Japanese companies here building cars. As long, you know, And the Honda dealer, the Honda manufacturer in Greensburg was building natural gas Civics. So the capability is here to, to adjust their lines they just have to decide to build them here. I think we have the infrastructure already to build them. They, we just have to decide to do it. But I, I, I'm, what I'm afraid of is that Indiana is not open to that sort of thing. But, the, but the, those three manufacturers are. They will be. I think they will be. Who is the we? What? Well, you know who the we is. I'm on camera, man. You know who the we is. <laughs> you know, there's the collective forces. That, you know, the people are trying to hold on, right? And that's okay. I mean, I, I get that. I get that. You know, the only cost of those change, right? So, yep. Hi, yes, very good talk. Thank you very much. I, I appreciate it. I'm actually a sustainability professional. Um, I work for IEPUI. I'm the director of sustainability for the university. And we often frame the argument of sustainability in three different ways. The environmental argument, the social argument, and also the economic argument. But working for a state institution, sometimes I don't get the opportunity to talk about the moral argument of all of this. And I was wondering if you could speak to that, given that we're in a Catholic institution, sort of the moral imperative that we have to act on this. Wow. 
Wasn't expecting to have to go there. <laughs> I, I know what it took for us to get to this point. I mean, it, coal and oil has been great to us over the last hundred years. Not much question about it, all right? But it's also given us dirty air. It's given us uh, poor health. Uh, if you don't think, it's, I mean, if you don't think that, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I just fundamentally disagree. <laughs> agree on that. Uh, if you go to Beijing and, De and Delhi right now, uh, it, it's just it's still there. You can see it. I, when I was young in the Marine Corps back in the 70s and early 80s. I knew when I was driving, I knew when I was getting, when I was driving across the country to duty stations, I knew when I was getting close to a major city because you could see the big brown cloud about 20 miles out. And we're living in that, right? We don't live in that. You can't really do that anymore unless it's a bad day. That's unusual. Uh, I do think it has, uh, uh, you know, people will dismiss this, but I, I don't dismiss this. I mean, the poor have more issues with this than, than the middle class and rich people do, right? Just the price of gas. I mean, I, uh, I didn't put the slide up here, but I've, I've got the slide where, uh, you know, if ga as gasoline goes up in price, you know, the poor pay about 12% of their income to gasoline when it gets to a certain point, and the rich, you know, at the most pay 2%. I mean, it's just crazy stuff, right? Uh, I get the same thing on uh, heating their homes and things like that. But just gasoline could get up to 12%. Uh, so there's... Uh, we just don't do a good job of understanding the health impacts and all that it takes to be poor in this country and allow them to move up uh, economically. I, I, we just, we're just not really good at that. I mean, I think it's in our character on some level, but we don't put it into play in certain ways. Um, I, I mean, I look at mass transit. It's not only cleaner, but it's an economic mobility issue because poor you know, I'm, I'm driving a nice 2017 Chevy Volt. I've had it for yeah, two, almost two years now. <clears throat> and that's, that's great. But a poor person who work, makes 10 bucks an hour drives a, a 1980 car that breaks down every month and gets 10 miles to the gallon. And we wonder why they can't move up economically. I mean, so mass transit is an issue. Mass transit to me is transit-oriented development and economic mobility for the poor. But you try to say that to certain people, they think you're nuts. But it's not nuts. We don't do a good job in understanding the energy costs uh, and how that affects the environmental. We don't do a good job with this and understand how it affects the poor. Uh, and we just, don't, we just don't do that. Uh, I wish we did. I think we're good. Again, I, I think we, I actually believe we think we do. I'm not sure we do as much as we should. Does that, does that answer the question okay? Okay. Sir? Yeah, not right now. Not right now. I looked at lithium primarily, and lithium uh, is not much of an issue. People are trying to say it is. And, and I've actually seen videos of people uh, on Facebook uh, you know, these four or five minute videos, just absolute lies on some of this stuff because there are people out there trying to destroy this already because they know what's coming because they know what's coming. Uh, there is, they call rare earth metals. Uh, Toyota just came out uh, this past week. I got, I got a news feed, all right? I got an Apple news feed and the NBA's on there, golf is on there, bicycling on there. Uh, politics is on there, but energy is on there too. Energy and transportation and all that's on my, my news feed. So I get this stuff every day. Uh, <clears throat> but Toyota just came out last week and said that they're going to use less than 50% of the rare earth metals here in the very near future for their electric cars. Because all that's happening as we speak. The battery, the battery, who knew that we were going to depend on chemists for all of this, right? Uh, but chemistry is becoming an extremely important discipline in the world of energy right now, uh, particularly in transportation, because they, because they can switch out the chemistries in these cars once they once they figure it out, and they are figuring it out. I I used to teach economics, uh, I don't know, 12, 15 years ago, when, right now the Marine Corps, and I remember, I would show my students. Uh, Commercials, or it's not my commercial. I mean, a TV vignette, you know, like sixty minutes type of thing, 
where the automobile manufacturers would be in front of Congress in 1950. We're going to have battery cars. We're going to have electric cars by in 20 years. In 1960, they said, we're going to have electric cars by in 20 years. In 1970, they said, we're going to have electric cars in 20 years. They kept saying it. It never happened. It is happening now. It is happening now. And what, what they're doing, I mean, there are several books I've read on this, but uh, the chemistry of all this is changing pretty rapidly, and they're going to get better at it because, you know, the gentleman that asked that question about uh, cobalt, I don't know, I didn't, I didn't look at cobalt much, I didn't look at lithium a lot, and there are some rare earth metals that are in there, but they're going to be minimized, extremely minimized. Now, you know, there are people worried about China because China's, frankly, out there buying lots of mines around the world because they want to produce them for their cars, for these types of cars. And they're afraid that China's going to have all the rare earth metals. I'm not sure that's going to happen. But, I mean, that's what they're talking about. So there's probably plenty of this stuff out there. We just have to see what it goes. But I'm sure, you know, all this all this works itself out. I'm sure that people had issues with internal combustion engine cars, too, when they started. Like I say, early on in, in the 1900s, 1910s, a third of the cars were electric, a third were steam, and a third were gasoline. Right? And gasoline won. Uh, but uh, and that was, and at the time, that was probably the right call. But it, this, this will work itself out, I'm pretty confident. Anything else? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it.